Well, all that riding around has sure made me hungry. Let's uh, cook up a snack. Well, you see, a mathematician is a, a bit like a chef. How so, you may wonder. Well, a chef begins with particular ingredients. For example, we have uh, green onions, uh, chicken breast here. We have uh, sugar, cornstarch, uh, cooking wine. We have also a recipe. The recipe tells us what to do with all these ingredients. We then cook it up in a particular way described by the recipe and hopefully we come out with a delicious, delicious result. In fact, if we take the same ingredients, follow the same recipe and cook it up the same way each time, we should come up with pretty much the exact same result. In a similar way, a computer programmer will write specific instructions for a computer. This, these instructions will tell the computer how to do something. This is called an algorithm. In a similar way, mathematicians have what is called a function. A function is a machine that takes a particular number, an input, applies a particular recipe to it, and comes out with an answer. It turns out that if you take the same number, put it in the function machine, apply the same recipe, you should always come out with the same answer. We're going to look a little bit about that next, but in the meantime, let's get to the task at hand, and that's cooking up our snack. Well, I have here a function machine. I've labeled it with a capital D, standing for distance. I'm going to use this machine to tell me the distance that I travel on my bicycle, given the time. So I put in inputs of time, and I come out with outputs of distance. But before I do that, let me illustrate a very important facet about functions. A function is a machine that, for every single input I put in, I only come out with a single output. So for instance, if I were to put a carrot in here, if I were to put a carrot in this function machine, I come out with sliced carrots. If I were to put a carrot in here tomorrow, I would still come out with an answer of sliced carrots. If I were to put in a carrot into this function machine next year, I would still come out with the answer of sliced carrots. And no matter where I am, whether I be in my kitchen, outside in the middle of a football field, standing on the moon, for instance, I would still come out with the answer of sliced carrots. And so that's an important fact about functions, is that the answer is always going to be a single specific answer for a single specific input. A carrot will lead to sliced carrots. So for instance, there's no way I would put a carrot, be able to put a carrot in there and let's say come out with tomatoes at some point. Well, let's go and use this function as we had intended to determine the distance that I travel as a function of time. If I were to travel for one hour, I would go five miles. So I put in the input of one hour and I come out with the output of five miles. If I were to travel for two hours on my bicycle, I put that as an input into my distance function, I would then end up with an answer of 10 miles. If I were to ride my bicycle for three hours, for instance, I put in the three hours into my function machine, I would end up with an output of 15 miles. Of course, if I were to travel for zero hours, that is, I would ride my bicycle for no time, then I would be traveling at no distance. So an input of zero hours will lead to an output of zero miles. Now though the units, those are the hours and the miles, though the units are very important part of this problem, for mathematicians when they deal with functions, they generally omit the units. So for instance, they would put in the number one, the number one meaning one hour, and come out with an answer of five, meaning five miles. If I were to put in the number two, I would end up with the answer of 10. If I were to put in the number 3, I would end up with the answer of 15. Now, of course, it's kind of cumbersome to lug around this big function machine, so mathematicians seek a more compact uh, description of this machine. And so we use an equation to describe this function, and that equation here is d of t, is equal to 5t. These parentheses here, mathematicians read as of, d of t, 
That is, the distance depends on the time. Distance is a function of time. And it's equal to 5t. Now, the 5t here means 5 times t. You see, the time sign is omitted. When mathematicians write, let's say, two things next to each other, like the 5 and the t, they mean to multiply them. So let's try this out. d of 1 is 5 times 1, which is 5. d of 2 is 5 times 2, which is 10. d of 3 is 5 times 3, which is 15. And of course, d of 0, meaning the distance I travel in 0 time, is equal to 5 times 0, or 0. Let's look at the machines around us and see whether they could represent a function or not. For instance, let's take a look at a parking meter. If I were to pull up to a parking space and put, say, a quarter in, I would get 50 minutes of time that I could park. If I were to come back tomorrow and put a quarter in, I would still get 15 minutes. If someone else were to pull in the same parking spot, they would also get 15 minutes of time. So in this particular case, a particular amount of money, say a quarter, would get a particular amount of time, say 15 minutes. Now let's look at a vending machine. Now if I were to put in a dollar in a vending machine, I could press a button for root beer and get out a root beer, but someone else coming along right after me might put a dollar in and get an orange drink. So because for a vending machine, for a particular input, a dollar, there could be multiple outputs, say root beer or orange drink or lemonade, this would not represent a function. We've seen that we can use this machine labeled d to represent a function. We've expressed the function d as an equation, d of t is equal to 5t. How else can we represent the function so that we can understand it better? Well, one thing we can do is graph the function. What does this mean? Well, let's take a sheet of graph paper, and at the bottom, along the horizontal axis, let's label it t. And let's begin by labeling, uh, starting with 0, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so forth. On the far left side, let's draw a vertical axis and label it D for distance. And let's mark out 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and so forth. Let's begin at T is equal to 1. So I go over to where T is equal to 1 along the horizontal axis. And let me plug in 1 into this equation. D of 1 is equal to 5 times 1, or 5. And so at t is equal to 1, I'm now going to go up 5 spaces. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And I'll put a dot there. Now at t is equal to 2, representing 2 hours, the distance that I travel is 5 times 2, or 10 miles. On the graph, I'm going to represent this by counting 10 spaces. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Put a dot. Now let's look at t is equal to 3, representing at 3 hours the distance that I travel is 15 miles. And so I'm going to represent this on the graph by going to t is equal to 3 along the horizontal axis and then counting 15 spaces. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. And I put a dot. Well, you get the idea. Let's do a simple one. At t is equal to 0, remember, the distance that I travel in 0 time, in 0 hours, is 0. And so at t is equal to 0, I just simply put a dot. I don't make any steps forward because I haven't gone anywhere. So now you can see that the four dots that I have already plotted so far all fall on a straight line. If I continue plugging in different values of t, t is equal to 5, t is equal to 6, t is equal to 20, and so forth, I will find that all the dots that I plot fall on the same line. Let me connect all of these dots. Now, because all of the dots fall on the same line, we call this function, this function d, capital D, a linear function. A linear function is a graph whose function is a line. Let's look at another example. So I'm going to look at another example of a function. I'm going to look at the function f of x is equal to 2x plus 1. I choose this function for a couple of reasons. One is, note that I named the function f. And typically, a script like f is used to designate the name of some generic, some run-of-the-mill function. I use x as my independent variable, that is my input. And typically, x is used as um, the variable to designate what is put in, what is the number that I put in. 
into the function machine named f. Now what do I get out? It's given by the equation 2x plus 1. Let's graph this function. Again, I take a sheet of coordinate uh, graph paper. Along the horizontal axis on the bottom, I label x. Along the vertical axis on the left-hand side, I label it y. Now you might wonder, why don't I label it f? Well, it's by convention. Convention is kind of a fancy math term to say. It's kind of by tradition. By tradition, we're going to label the vertical axis y. These are the values of the dependent variable. This is the value of the function. And along the x-axis, it's going to represent the values of the possible inputs. So let's put in some different inputs. x is equal to 1. What do I get? 2 times 1 plus 1 is 3. So at x equal 1, I go three spaces. 1, 2, 3. I put a dot. At x is equal to 2, I plug it in the equation. I get 2 times 2, 4, plus 1 is 5. I step forward. I go five spaces. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. I put a dot. X is equal to 3. I put in 3. 2 times 3 plus 1 is 7. So at x equal 3, I step ahead. I go 7 spaces. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And I put a dot. If I continue the process, I find all the dots fall on the same line. Oh yes, let's do x is equal to 0. x equals 0, I get 2 times 0 plus 1, or 1. So we can see that the four dots that I've plotted all fall in a line, and so we call f a linear function. So far we've looked at functions whose graphs are lines, or linear functions. Now we're going to look at a function whose graph is not a line. Let's look at the function f of x is equal to x squared. What x squared means is to take x and multiply by itself. So what this function does is it takes the input, represented by x, and multiplies it by itself. It squares it. So for instance, if I were to take x is equal to 1, the value of f, the value of the function that is, at x equal 1, is 1 squared, or 1 times 1 is 1. The value of the function at x equal to 2 is 2 squared, or 2 times 2, or 4. The value of the function at 3 is 3 squared, or 9. And of course, the value at 4 is 4 squared, or 16. Oh yes, I forgot 0. The value of the function at 0 is 0 squared, or 0. Now let's graph these points. I, again, I'm going to take a coordinate plane, piece of graph paper. At the bottom, and the horizontal axis, I'm going to label it x. These are the values of my input. On the vertical axis, on the far left, I'm going to label it y for values of the output. And now I'm going to graph these points. At x equal to 1, I go 1 space because the value of the function is 1. 1 times 1 is 1. At x equal to 2, the value of the function is 2 squared or 4, so I'm going to go 4 spaces. 1, 2, 3, 4, and put a dot. At x equal to 3, the value of the function is 3 squared or 9, and so I'm going to go nine spaces, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and put a dot. Now let's look at x is equal to four. The value of the function is four squared, or 16, and I'm going to count 16 spaces and put a dot. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, put a dot. Well, of course I got x equal to zero. The value of the function at x equal to zero is 0 squared or 0, and so I'm going to put a dot here at the origin. The origin is just a fancy mathematical term, meaning the point whose x value is 0 and whose y value is 0. Now, if I try to connect the dots, I find that no line will do it. In fact, I have to draw a curve in order to connect the dots together. This curve is so important, it has a special name, and that name is a parabola. Now, in this particular graph, we only show the right side of a parabola. If we were to draw the complete parabola, it would look kind of like a bowl shape. And so, in the next lecture, we're going to take a closer look. We're going to be a detective and take a closer look at this graph.